what do you like? Tell me what you like. There's value in that because it almost gives the brain like a vacation, right? Holistic health is completely underappreciated, but so critical. Eating whole foods and the key is just to find something that you really enjoy. Welcome to the NAMP Nourishing You podcast. I'm Kristen Burkett. And I'm Diana Wally. We're your hosts for NAMP's podcast dedicated to connecting holistic health enthusiasts with each other to share practical information from the holistic wellness space for enhanced vitality. Diana and I are master nutrition therapists, board certified in holistic nutrition with private practices and an online joint venture that supports clients and practitioners as they strive to reach their full potential. We're honored to be hosting this podcast for NAMP and connecting our listeners with the latest in holistic wellness. If you enjoyed today's show, help us out by commenting below, liking this video and subscribing to the channel to help us spread the word. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Nourishing You podcast. We can't wait to speak with Dr. Christine Marin today about all things thyroid. Dr. Christine Marin, DO, is a board certified physician and the founder of a virtual functional medicine practice in Colorado, Michigan, and Texas. She is also the co-founder of Hey Mommy, a platform dedicated to helping women navigate a happy and healthy motherhood. Dr. Marin was introduced to functional medicine after struggling with pregnancy complications and recurrent miscarriages. A functional, functional medicine approach helped her address her own underlying health issues associated with gut infections, hypothyroidism, hormone imbalance, and mold toxicity. Now a mother of three, she's devoted her professional life to helping women optimize their health before pregnancy, thrive postpartum, and get their lives back. Dr. Marin is board certified by the American Board of Family Medicine and is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. She's a compassionate cl clinician, speaker, and wellness advocate. She's married to a surgeon and together they balance rewarding careers while raising three beautiful children. Learn more at drchristinemarin.com. Welcome Dr. Marin, we're excited to have you with us today. Thanks for having me, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So for the listener, you're in for a real treat today. I have the good fortune to live in the same community as Dr. Marin, and not only is she a respected physician, but she's an incredible mom, and I can attest to the fact that her three children are the cutest on the planet. <laughs> um, and really, Dr. Marin walks her talk, and I think this is so important um, and refreshing, especially in this age of questionable social, social media influencers, so I think you really have to have to um, you know, watch out who you follow, and she's someone that, that's really trusted. But uh, Dr. Marin, so for people that don't know you, can you give us a sense of your path and what made functional medicine something you wanted to dedicate your life to? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for the intro. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I went to medical school really kind of on the cusp, like, do I go to naturopathic school or chiropractic school? I mean, I was really into alternative and holistic medicine. And I went to my undergrad in Boulder. And honestly, I kind of thought everything alternative was good. Um, like if it was alternative, I was like, sign me up. And um, medical school really brought me back to the middle. Um, I ended up going and getting my doctor of osteopathic medicine. So I went to osteopathic medical school. It felt like a better fit, you know, for my more sort of holistic passions. And um, like I said, it brought me back to the middle, but I really entered medical school already sort of thinking like I was gonna follow Andrew Weil and sort of go down that path. Um, and part of that was because both of my sisters had thyroid disease and one of my sisters had um, radioactive thyroid, th thyroid ablation essentially. Um, and the other one had Hashimoto's and I at the time didn't know that I had thyroid disease but had always been watching it. Anyways, fast forward, I finished medical school. I did my family medicine residency and I picked that uh, because I felt like it was gonna give me sort of the broadest training so that I could have a holistic practice. But I didn't know about functional medicine yet. I just knew about all this other, like, you know, this other paradigm where we choose herbs instead of pharmaceuticals or whatever it might be. And then I suffered through recurrent pregnancy loss. And I knew there was something wrong with me and I just needed the root cause. Like those other alternatives weren't giving me the answer. And a mentor of mine had done some functional medicine and introduced me to it. And I started really going down that path 
and realized like, oh, this is actually where I'm going to get the answers I need. And so, of course, my professional and personal lives collided. And, you know, once you know what you know, like professionally, like it was the obvious answer for me. And so I started pursuing that from a professional aspect as well. Um, so early in my career, after I did my functional medicine training, I worked with Amy Myers and it was a really good introduction to see lots of different patients um, all across the country. And, um, you know, from there, I opened my own practice and have really focused a lot on sort of women's health and hormones, reproductive health, thyroid, Hashimoto's, gut health and environmental kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it's all the stuff I've dealt with myself. Your journey is, it's, you know, just the true testimony to holistic health and how, I don't know, I see like this common thread with those of us that pra practice somewhere in this field. Like we've all had a personal story, it seems like, that led us there. And yeah, yeah so I love that. Um, sorry about your miscarriages. I um, have yeah. total empathy. I, I wish I had understood why I went through the same thing and I didn't till too late. So, you know, but we're here to help other people, right? And that's- yeah. Yeah. At all, that's all. I mean, like Diana said, I have three kids now. And like the thing that healed that pain was having my other children, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a rough time. And I work with lots of patients going through that. And I, I mean, I, I get it. It is so hard to go through. And I remember my husband saying, it's not your fault, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I get it, but there's something wrong with me. Like yeah. there is something wrong with my body. Like I know there is. So just trust me. Like it's, let's figure this out, you know? Well, I think there are lots of women out there um, in our audience right now that probably have suboptimal thyroid issues as well as other imbalances mm -hmm. going yeah. on. So I know this topic is going to be very helpful for a lot of people out there. So let's take a deeper dive. And before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, can you just give us a basics on what's our thyroid? Why is it so important? Um, what do we need to understand just about those basics? Yeah. So the thyroid gland sits in our neck, um, kind of just around the Adam's apple area and makes thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone basically guides basal metabolism all over the body. So we think about it a lot in terms of like maybe cholesterol and blood sugar. It also guides metabolism in our gut. And so constipation or different gut infections are associated with thyroid disease. Um, our thyroid takes signals from our brain. So our hypothalamus and pituitary are in our brain. And those basically send signals out to our thyroid gland. That's how the endocrine or the hormone system works. We get all these different signals that come from our brain. Okay. So I, I you, and you hear people talking about hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, Hashimoto's. Can you explain the, the, the different types and, and, and maybe dig a little deeper there. Yeah. So hypothyroidism is most common. Hyperthyroidism is less common. Hypothyroidism, people tend to feel kind of tired, gaining weight, maybe losing hair. Um, hypo, it's slow. Hyper is fast, tends to be more like anxiety, almost like you drink, you know, 17 cups of coffee kind of situation. Um, much less common, though some people with Hashimoto's can experience both of those symptoms all at the same time, really, because um, the hyperthyroidism can be transient or temporary. So Hashimoto's refers to an autoimmune disease, which eventually will affect thyroid function. But I always tell my patients, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune problem. It's not necessarily a thyroid problem. It starts as an immune system issue. Autoimmunity is super common. Um, and Hashimoto's is one of the many different autoimmune diseases that we can get, but it is very common in, in American women. And it is the most common cause of hypothyroidism among American women, though there are other causes of hypothyroidism. Um, and I think really it's quite underdiagnosed because a lot of people who have hypothyroidism don't necessarily know that it's from Hashimoto's if their thyroid antibodies haven't been tested. So what are some of the more common functions that we see impacted by hypothyroid? Let's kind of focus there since it seems to be the majority is hypo versus hyper. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that and what areas of the body um, count yeah. on thyroid and what can be affected by it. So like I mentioned, metabolism is important. So sometimes uh, people who have hypothyroidism have a hard time losing weight, though not always. Some people with hypothyroidism are thin. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily you have to be overweight, though, um, you know, it tends to be like slow metabolism, trouble losing weight, higher than expected blood sugar. Um, again, it doesn't mean you have diabetes, but, you know, if your blood sugar seems a little off, um, it can also cause high cholesterol as associated with heart disease when untreated. 
Um, it also guides metabolism in the gut. And so one of the common symptoms of hypothyroidism is constipation, though it, not everybody has that. It could also cause things like bloating and is associated with gut infections like SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. It talks to your pancreas and your stomach acid and your gut motility. All of that relies on the thyroid. Um, also, people with hypothyroidism sometimes have brain fog, anxiety, or depression. Certain people are more sensitive to thyroid hormone on when it comes to mood. Um, I find this in my clinical practice, but also there are some genes that we can look at, like DIO1 and DIO2, which indicate that somebody might be a little bit more susceptible to the negative effects um, that thyroid could have on mood. Um, it also impacts ovulation. And so if you are hypo or hyperthyroid, um, you may not ovulate, which would cause irregular menstrual cycles and infertility. And it's very closely associated with fertility and pregnancy loss. So there's a high rate of miscarriage in people who have untreated hypothyroidism. Um, what am I missing, ladies? What about... Um cholesterol yeah. issues or sleep issues. I think yeah, sleep those are on the is list. A, for sure. Sleep is a big one too. Untreated thyroid dysfunction can affect sleep. Um, and, and I think it's so hypo and hyperthyroidism are both associated with like insomnia, restless leg syndrome, obs obstructive sleep apnea, um, mm. cholesterol, heart disease, you know, that sort of like, I kind of put, lump that in with metabolism and metabolic issues um, like blood sugar and things like that. Um, skin, I mean, dry skin, a lot of joint pain, like a lot of times when people have untreated hypothyroidism, they'll be suffering from hair loss, dry skin, joint pain, things like that. Interesting. And I've, I've heard, um, and you can tell me if this is true, that, um, oftentimes when women are going through a change in their life, um, hormonally, so maybe it's pregnancy, maybe it's menopause, um, that that can be a, a time that we see a thyroid issue arise. Is that true? Absolutely. I'm okay. so glad you brought that up because pregnancy is a good example of when this happens. So when we get pregnant, we make a ton of hormones. When we make a ton of hormones, our body makes sex hormone binding globulin and thyroid binding globulin. We know that happens in pregnancy. It's totally natural. And you can look at it on labs. You can see something called SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin. It's a simple lab to order. And you can see that increase. And as that increases, it shows us that it's binding up free hormone. So we know as soon as a woman becomes pregnant, if she's on thyroid medication, likely she'll need a 25 to 30% increase in that medication. So if you're listening to this and you're trying to conceive, make sure you know that and talk to your doctor about it because it's one of those things that it's, this is American Thyroid Association news. This is not like a functional medicine kind of thing, but yeah. it's just not well known. It's not something I knew when I trained in family medicine and, and we're the ones who see preconception patients, you know, you don't see OBGYN until you're like eight, 10 weeks, something like that. So pregnancy is a good example of how that happens. And in that same way, that might happen if somebody goes on birth control. So when you go on birth control mm -hmm. and take hormones, you make more SHBG, that might affect thyroid function. It's probably not going to be the thing that like, makes you overtly hypothyroid, but it will likely affect your dose and how well you're managed. Same with menopause. So hormones are going to change drastically. And then, at, you know, plus or minus if somebody's on hormone replacement therapy, that will also impact thyroid. So, you know, as you're playing with hormones, you just got to pay close attention to what's happening with the thyroid. That makes sense. So it's, it's just definitely an important gland for our overall health. And it's like, it's the master gland, I guess. Yeah. It really is kind of what it's called, right? Yeah. So as we go into the hypothyroid area, can we talk a little bit more about, um, about Hashimoto's a little bit and what, what is that? What can contribute to that? Yeah, for sure. So I see a lot of patients with Hashimoto's and I see a lot of patients who have lots of symptoms and don't know why, and they end up having Hashimoto's. So it can cause, you know, a lot of different symptoms from palpitations to depression, to hair loss, to weight gain, to anxiety, whatever it might be. Um, so we can measure that simply through thyroid antibodies. So thyroid peroxidase or TPO are the most commonly elevated thyroglobulin antibodies. I also measure um, and you can sometimes see it on a thyroid ultrasound. So if those antibodies are negative, you know, you can check a thyroid ultrasound sometimes if indicated. So that indicates that there's an autoimmune disease that's affecting your thyroid gland. Now, over time, the longer that goes on, the more 
the higher your chance of having hypothyroidism. But if you catch it in the initial stages, you might not have a lot of loss of thyroid function. So your hormones might be still okay, but you still have this underlying autoimmune condition that needs to be treated, in my opinion. So if you see you know, a conventional endocrinologist, the general opinion is like, well, okay, you have Hashimoto's, there's really nothing to do about it. Um, but you know, I would argue the exact opposite because I, that's what I do every day of my life in my clinical practice. So, um, we can follow thyroid antibodies and you can see them trend down as we're doing the right thing. And I see it all the time. And I know that this, there's some literature that supports this, but by and large, the conventional medical community doesn't follow thyroid antibodies. They just check it one time if they check it at all. And if it's high, then you have Hashimoto's and that's the end of the story and take some thyroid hormone. The alternative or like the functional medicine approach to that is that we can help an autoimmune disease um, by really working on intestinal hyperpermeability or what most people know as leaky gut and environmental triggers. So that comes down to a triad um, originally described by Alessio Fasano. So that triad is genetic predisposition, which we can't really change intestinal hyperpermeability, and that's where gut health is really important, and environmental triggers. So one big, huge environmental trigger is pregnancy or miscarriage. Um, can also be really stressful events, um, you know, mold exposure, things like that. And I mean, really with my patients, I sort of, we go through the whole history and try to figure out, you know, what's at play here. But the gut is like, you know, step one, let's work on gut health. Okay. So you talked about potential triggers, genetics, and you had mentioned that your sisters both. Yeah. 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 So ge yeah. Genetics and environment, gut health. What role does stress play? Yeah. Huge. Okay. Stress is so big. And it's like, I kind of think of stress as the straw that breaks the camel's back, mm -hmm. but maybe not like the underlying issue. Like it's not the reason, like not everybody with stress gets Hashimoto's, okay. but if you have Hashimoto's or if you have hypo or hyperthyroidism, you're less resilient to stress actually. Like there have been studies looking at stress resilience with this particular thing. Now I think the most interesting aspect of stress, and this is newer research, um, in 2018, there was a big study out of Sweden looking at how psychological stress actually increases your risk of autoimmune disease. So in the past, this was like maybe a theory, but now it's studied. We know psychological stress can make you more susceptible to getting an autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's. So that is truly, you know, it's, it, it is a big deal, but it's like, is it, you know, again, it's like, is it the straw that broke the camel's back? I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely think there's more at play than just stress alone. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, it plays a big role. And in terms of managing thyroid hormone, um, stress plays a big role in our conversion between T4 and T3. So when we think about doing all these thyroid labs, we've got TSH, which is a measure of how your brain is signaling to your thyroid gland. When I talked earlier about the hypothalamus and pituitary, that's up there. Mm -hmm. And TSH sends signals to your gland to make T4. T4 has to convert to T3, and that happens outside of your gland. And some of that T4 also goes to reverse T3. Reverse T3 is like your metabolic breaks. And so when you're high stress, reverse T3 can go high as well, pushing on those metabolic breaks. I usually think of reverse T3 sort of like if we lived in a cave and we couldn't find food and we broke a leg, we want to push on the metabolic brakes. We want our metabolism to slow down. But it, this is a different world right now, <laughs> right? We don't really want that to happen yeah. um, normally, even though, I mean, sometimes clearly we have to slow down, but like, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, there's a reason that we have reverse T3. Okay. Um, but it, it usually, it's one of those things when I see it really, really high, I definitely think about stress as a big factor. Do you also see inflammation increasing that reverse T3? Yeah, for sure. Inflammation, yeah, for sure. toxins, infections. I always tell my patients, like if reverse T3 is really high, like we got to look at everywhere else. Like what else is going on? Heavy metals, like there's something else at play. And mm -hmm. I think just for the listeners, if reverse T3, it's a nice to have, you know, it's not like a crucial, you don't have to have it. A lot of doctors in some labs won't even do it. Um, and it, even if your reverse T3 is high, it's just, you just have to understand what it means in context, but usually it means you have to dig some more. Okay. Well, really what you're saying is like, if we have high reverse T3, but we're making the right amounts of free T3, then 
it's not going to get into the cells and do its job, right? Because it's kind of being blocked. Yeah, so the reverse field. Yeah, so yeah. that's kind of the reason why that would be important. Yeah, yeah, it can definitely make sense of some symptoms that patients are having. Um, so if free T4 looks normal, but they have a really high reverse T3 and a really low free T3, that helps us understand like, okay, well, this is why you feel this way, but right. it's not an easy solution. Right. But that doesn't always mean you need thyroid medication, right? Like that, exactly. that means there's something else going on exactly. with the body in terms of an imbalance. So, you know, you're talking about this cascade, which I, you know, I explain this to clients all the time and it's quite a process, right? For the mm -hmm. brain to tell the thyroid and to make the hormone and to get to the cells, it's quite a little train that has to go on. Other than Hashimoto's, which might interrupt this in its way, what are some of the other things that can interrupt or maybe not have all of those steps work as well as they should? Things yeah. that may not be autoimmune disease, it may just be other contributing factors. Yeah, nutrient deficiencies are certainly one of those factors outside of the United States and iodine um, deficient countries, that iodine deficiency is the number one cause of hypothyroidism. I do think that probably plays some role here because we don't actually eat that much iodine in Colorado. Um, you know, so iodine's a tricky one. It's like a little bit of that Goldilocks nutrient, like too much isn't great, but too little is not great either. So just be cautious with iodine. Um, taking a lot of it doesn't make hypothyroidism go away, but we do need some. Um, so iodine plays a big one. B-complex vitamins, amino acids like tyrosine are important. Um, selenium and zinc are super important, especially for thyroid conversion. Um, so nutrient deficiencies are a big one. Stress, as we talked about, and HPA axis dysfunction. So I didn't really go into that too much, but stress can cause HPA axis dysfunction. Um, to think of it simply like women who stop getting their period because they're really stressed. This is basically HPA axis dysfunction. So our HPA axis hypothalamus pituitary, A is adrenal that sits atop our kidneys. Adrenal glands produce cortisol. And then you could take it further, HPA TG, so T thyroid G gonads or ovaries. So that is why, you know, stress hormone and thyroid and um, our sex hormones are, are linked so closely. Um, toxicity, so uh, like heavy metals and things like that can cause problems with thyroid hormone. Um, what else am I missing here? I think that's, yeah, I think that covers it. I just kind of on that same train of thought, why do, why do you think it is that that conventional medicine misses this? Is it because they're not doing thorough testing? Is it because um, they don't really have a treatment for Hashimoto's? Like what's going on there? Yeah, I don't think they really have a treatment. There's no okay. treatment paradigm for Hashimoto's okay. in conventional medicine. When I was trained in family medicine, I remember diagnosing a kiddo with hypothyroidism. I mean, he was like a 17 year old boy. Um, and I'm like, why is he hypothyroid? That's kind of rare to see in a 17 year old boy. And um, he ended up having Hashimoto's, but I didn't have anything to do about it. Like, oh, you have Hashimoto's. I don't, I don't have any answers for that. So I think that is a part of it. I think also they're not testing for thyroid peroxidase and thyroglobulin antibodies very often. It's just it's just not tested. It's not on the list of things they do. In general, um, in medicine, we're sort of encouraged to order less, um, you know, probably driven by insurance companies, though lab testing really isn't that expensive. So I don't think that makes any sense personally. Um, you know, it's like makes more sense to me from a financial, if we're looking purely financially, it makes more sense to me to get people treated earlier than later, though insurance companies are looking at like short term metrics. Yeah. So um, that's probably a piece of it. Um, I think there's a lack of education and awareness around it, especially when it comes to thyroid and fertility and, um, you know, kind of preconception. Um, and I will say too, like, I see both sides of the coin. Um, I see patients who come to me from other alternative sort of practitioners and they're on the right or the wrong kind of thyroid medication or way too much. I mean, I have a patient with like her main complaint was anxiety. And, you know, I'm like, well, you're on way too much thyroid medication. That's pretty obvious. Like, let's fix that obvious thing first and then go from there. And we eventually got her on to the right dose and just kind of slowly backed off slowly, slowly. And it, it got better. And so I do think like as a conventional doctor, they probably see, you know, a good handful of patients who are maybe on too much thyroid medication, their side effects to too much of it. Um, and I, I don't know, those are the best answers I can come up with at this point in my life. Um, yeah. You know, it is interesting though, because 
a lot of clients that I'll that I talk with, they their doctors will run a TSH, and that but that's kind of the the end of the story. And can you just kind of explain, just take it just back to the basics of the detail of why TSH is not enough, yeah, and why that T3. I mean, you've explained it a little bit, but maybe it's a maybe good just point. back up to that yeah. one one more time because I I feel like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody says, well, my TSH is fine. So yeah. my and TSH is fine. is fine. Just there's it's a loaded kind of comment because TSH, the reference range for TSH goes up to 4.5. Now that is somewhat controversial. Like there are endocrinologists who would argue that that reference range shouldn't go up so high. The reference range for healthy individuals is skewed way on the lower end of the range. So healthy individuals have a TSH you know, closer to two or less, you know, one to two, one to 2.5, something like that. Um, so that's sort of been a debated factor is like, how high should this TSH really go up? And by the way, if you're trying to conceive, the normal range should go to 2.5, but the lab doesn't know that you're trying to conceive. So your lab won't be flagged as abnormal. So unfortunately you have to advocate for yourself most of the time in that situation, because that's not a functional medicine or, or alternative medicine guideline. That is ATA, American Thyroid Association, like, 2.5. Hmm. But outside of trying to conceive, we'll accept up to four and a half as normal. Um, again, debated. And if we're not checking a T4, we're not checking for secondary hypothyroidism. So secondary hypothyroidism refers to not enough thyroid hormone when TSH is normal. So you hmm. could have a normal TSH, but a low free T4. And if you see an endocrinologist, they usually check a TSH and a T4. If you see primary care a lot of what I see ordered is sometimes TSH with reflex to T4. That means if your TSH is above four and a half, then they'll check a free T4. But I do think it's important to, to check both TSH and free T4 from the get-go. Um, now TSH is, again, that measure from your brain signaling your thyroid gland to make hormone. So I always think like when TSH goes high, that means hypothyroidism because TSH is trying to stimulate thyroid stimulating hormone. It's trying to stimulate the thyroid because it doesn't see enough hormone. If TSH is low, that usually indicates hyperthyroidism or over treatment with thyroid medication in some instances. And that's, you know, it's just kind of backing off. It's a negative feedback loop, but that loop doesn't always work. So when TSH is abnormal, you can trust it most of the time when it's normal, I think it's still important to dig deeper. Well, regardless, I think it's dig it's important to dig deeper, you know, and get more data. Um, and by the way, that data is not that expensive. Like if somebody bought a full thyroid panel from a lab, it's like 50 bucks. I mean, it's not, you know, yeah. wow. it's not going to break the bank. Right. And, you know, I think sometimes people get a little bit concerned that, you know, if the TSH is off, that it's automatically going to go to this Hashimoto's issue, but that is not really the case. I see a lot of clients that just are not getting enough minerals in their diet and they're missing that selenium and some of those key nutrients. And once we get those back on board, gosh, the, the whole world changes for them in terms of thyroid function and how they feel. So, you know, I think it's an area that it's, it's too bad. It's not looked into deeper from a conventional standpoint and, when so, when oftentimes simple fixes can make such a big difference, it's worth like paying attention to and not just saying, oh, I'm fine. And just always living, feeling not like yourself. You know, yeah. there's, there's mm -hmm. lots that can be done. Yeah. For sure. I think, you know, if you are seeing your primary care doctor, if you're fatigued, let them know I have fatigue. They might check a TSH, but you could ask for it. Could you please check my thyroid? <laughs> You know, you sometimes have to remind them. Um, but if you have, if you're going to see some a doctor because you're tired, one of the primary things they should check is your thyroid along with iron. I don't think I mentioned iron earlier, but that plays an important role with thyroid function as well. And so, you know, check some nutrient levels, but check thyroid function, check it out. If it's not normal, like it's something that needs to be addressed. It shouldn't be ignored because it can lead to all these other sequelae.
And and speaking of being ignored, I had a client who um, said that her physician, and she wasn't seeing a functional medicine doctor, she was seeing a conventional doctor, and left her a message saying, hi, so-and-so, you have Hashimoto's, have a nice day. Yes. And she called me and said, I don't even know what that is. And they left it on my voicemail. And yeah, yes. and yeah, oh. so mm. I know. Kind of you, that's like strikes a chord with me so hard because the same thing happened with me. I, of course, knew what Hashimoto, I like knew I had it. and But I had established care with a new primary care doctor here in Colorado, mostly because I needed my pap smear. Yeah. And her medical assistant called me and said, hey, so we got your labs back and you have Hashimoto's okay, that's like the end of story, right? And I'm like, uh, and what else? And like, why is a medical assistant telling me this? And this isn't to bash doctors because right. working in primary care is hard. Right. Um, but I, it's the system is not set up the right way. Um, I really think like when you review your labs, you ought to do that with your doctor. That's like a whole separate visit. Like you see the doctor, they do your pap, they order labs, and then go back to them or set up a telemedicine visit and go through all those labs and understand what they mean because they have like hundreds of charts in front of them trying to review all this. It's hard. So normally if you see like a functional medicine doctor or sometimes a concierge primary care doctor, they have more time, they have less patience and they can kind of get through that. But yes, I, it's, it's really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness. There's practitioners like you. Yeah. Could you share some of those more optimal ranges? You mentioned TSH and trying to get that between 1 and 2.5 is kind of more the what we see optimal. Are there some more optimal ranges for like the free T4 and or and free T3 or which ones you think are most important that yeah, people might sure. want to jot down just to yep. have, you know? And this, I have a full article on my website that'll outline this and like show you my sort of thyroid diagram and make more sense of this. Um, but TSH 1 to 2, free T4, like 1.1 to 1.5, and free T3, 3.2 to 3.8. Those would be my sweet spots. That's where I try to get all my patients. Um, you know, if your free T3 is 2.9 and the rest of those looks normal, like, you know, it's not normally something I treat, but then I start to think about like, well, what else can we do to decrease the reverse T3 maybe or support better free T3 production? Sometimes I see patients with a free T3, like really, really low, like 2.2 or something like that. Or, you know, that's when it's outside of the reference range, especially for free T3, that's really, really, really low. Okay. All right. Good to know. So might want to rewind and Take some notes on that one <laughs> if any of you are following that and you're just not sure that what when your doctor said your labs look fine you're you're normal and maybe you've had some of those levels measured you might go back and look at those numbers and see oh well are they optimal yeah i think what people forget is lab ranges oftentimes are adjusted to the the area that they live in and it's the people that are taking those labs right and so it's not always the healthiest population that they're basing those conventional ranges on. So it's not going to be optimal function. So anyway, um, good. I'm, I'm glad that maybe our audience can note those. Um, so let's transition now because you've given us such a good, um, uh, you know, overview of why the thyroid is important and maybe some causes of, of, of thyroid dysfunction. So can we talk about um, how to improve thyroid function from a functional medicine perspective? I think that's going to really help people to dig in there. Yeah. So if, first of all, if you have hypothyroidism, know if it's caused by an autoimmune disease. Okay. And if you do have Hashimoto's, it's, I think, pretty important to work with a functional medicine practitioner who can help you navigate the space because it's complicated. Sometimes it's heavy metals, sometimes it's gut health. Number one is look for SIBO. So small intestine bacterial overgrowth is incredibly common in patients with Hashimoto's. In studies, more than 50% of patients with Hashimoto's have that. Symptoms being bloating, usually loose stool, gas belching, sometimes constipation. And so, is that, sorry to interrupt, is that because your digestion is slowed down yeah, it's okay. kind of like the chicken or the egg because okay. there's this thyroid gut loop. Okay. So thyroid guides basal metabolism in your gut okay. and motility, digestive enzyme function. But then the gut is also really important for the thyroid, probably is playing a huge role in conversion between T4 and T3, plays a big role with Hashimoto's. So 
we don't really know, but I think it's kind of like, it's a two way street. Um, and I think in that same vein, like there are other gut infections that patients with Hashimoto's have, we're looking for causes of intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut, remove and replace, remove the infection, replace the digestive enzymes. So that whole like gut health piece can get complicated to navigate, but to keep it really simple, like figure out what your gut infection is, get rid of it, take gluten out. That's also on the remove list because gluten increases intestinal permeability in studies, gluten and SIBO are shown to increase intestinal permeability and then replace digestive enzymes. So things like stomach acid, I like to use bitters. Bitters is like a really simple, safe one that anybody can use. HCL, like patin HCL gets a little bit more complicated and pancreatic enzymes, but those play a role. And that's just a good like starting point. So if you have Hashimoto's, that's important. I mean, really anybody with any sort of hormone condition should also be watching for environmental toxins. I mean, anybody on the planet should be careful about environmental toxins. That's not going to hurt anybody. Um, we should all watch our exposure to these toxins because they can cause cancer, but they're also endocrine disruptors. So they can mess with our hormone system. So getting rid of plastics. I had a patient the other day, literally she's cooking in a crock pot with a plastic bag liner. That's like something so and I saw a meme that like plastic is the millennials lead like we were all exposed to like lead and mercury and now like they're you know cooking food in a plastic bag. So all those plastics like they leach chemicals which affect our endocrine system and this again goes back to like this is not functional medicine we pay more attention to it, but this is well known endocrine disruptors these are well known. Um, so, you know, chemicals, plastics, fragrance, um, cleaning up your, your house. I have a whole ebook on my website called 12 ways to detox your home. That's like a step-by-step -step guide, but just really like step-by-step -step trying to clean up all of those exposures as much as you can. So it's really comes back to that lifestyle piece piece. Like you could start simply with like gluten-free and like cleaning up all the chemicals and then get more complicated with the gut function piece. Um, and then, you know, what else? I mean, stress management is important you know, taking a good like supplementation, obviously, you know, my, I'm sort of always going to advocate for some amount of supplementation in most people, um, because I think most of us are deplete in certain nutrients, though. I don't, I guess not everybody needs it, but all of my patients basically need some, like, even if it's minimal, you know, um, B complex vitamins, something like that. So, um, yeah, that sort of thing. And what about exercise? I, you know, I'm an exercise fanatic, but I, I understand that people with, with thyroid um, issues might need to be careful with exercise, but is some important? What are your thoughts I'm on that? I'm so glad you bring that up because there is this misconception that people shouldn't exercise. Yeah. Like at first, like there's, it's, it's all about balance at the end of the day, you know, like if you have hypothyroidism and you go and you like do CrossFit and you feel like crap the next day, that's too much for you. Also, if you have too much for most people, just <laughs> yeah, so. I know anyway, it's just, it, it can be too much for many women. Right. Yeah. So also you shouldn't not do anything. Um, that is not great for your system either. So, um, gosh, I'd have to go back and look at studies. I feel like I read one study showing that exercise, um, improved free T3, but I can't remember exactly, but I think, you know, there's that sweet spot. So it really is like listening to your body. Like if you're exercising, you're doing something that's too much and you feel really bad the day after you've gone too hard, you need to back off. Okay. But you know? it's, it's not, it's not an ex a excuse to sit on the couch and for sure. Not. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I want to go back to, you said to avoid gluten because of the trigger for intestinal permeability. Is there another relationship with thyroid and gluten um, or is that not? I don't so know of one. I mean, that's in like terms the of Hashimoto's one. and yeah. like in, the molecular terms, mimicry thing. Oh yeah, like that. molecular mimicry probably plays a role, but I think I really think the bigger deal just comes back to intestinal hyperpermeability. Yeah. Now there is also a link between celiac disease and Hashimoto's. So I always do tell patients like if you're going to remove gluten, you might want to test a celiac panel before you do that because you can get it in the blood work. So if you're thinking about doing that, and you're eating gluten, like it's again, it's something you have to ask for, but um, but there is, you know, there is that link. Um, but I would say in general, um, if, if you have hypothyroidism, especially Hashimoto's, I think gluten-free is the way to go. Okay. Good. 
Um, so I think, you know, as we wrap up here, you've done such a good job of explaining how functional me- the functional medicine model, you know, that looks at nutrition and stress and gut health and toxins, exercise is really the best approach. Um, it's never just one thing, right? Uh, so tell us like about you personally. So how do you incorporate these principles into your own life, especially with how busy you are, raising mm-hmm. your family, all that? It's such a loaded question. And when you read my bio, there's this part at the end about balance. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to achieve balance in my life. I love my job. And I also love my three kids and my husband and myself. And I don't know. I mean, let's be real here. Like, it's not easy. I don't know. Like this modern day world situation where we're like balancing a practice and like three kids, like, I don't know. So I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. Um, And it's not easy, but I mean, I just, lifestyle practices have just become part of my habitual everyday practice. It's the things you do every day and consistently that make the most difference in your life. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've gone through like, I mean, I always like approached my life with healthy living principles anyways. I was eating organic foods from the onset, but then my, you know, products turned organic. And then I became really conscious about my home and my air quality and my water quality. So I do a lot of things, but to keep it really simple, I eat healthy food. For dinner, I usually have protein, some sort of starch, like a potato, like a gluten-free starch, and a lot of veggies. Um, And then I try to eat like 25 to 30 grams of protein for breakfast and lunch, but I'm not always successful at that. Mm -hmm. And when I'm not, I use collagen peptides. Um, I don't do things like smoke cigarettes and drink a lot of alcohol. I actually follow my heart rate variability and things like that on my aura ring. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you like alcohol is a deal breaker for heart rate variability. And like, I hate to, I know people are listening to this who are like, well, I just drink glass wine every night. You probably won't once you realize like, what it does to your heart rate variability. I'm sorry to drop that one on you. Um, And it doesn't mean I never drink. Like I'm not, you know, it's, I, I'm not here to demonize alcohol, but it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't help my health. Um, so, I mean, those are, you know, some principles I, like in my home, I have air filtration and water filtration. I just do my best without making myself crazy and without making my husband crazy. But I think he's a little bit over the top right now. He's trying to scale back on that one. Cause um, that's already happened. Um, you know, I mean, there's only so long that you can be like, please take your shoes off. Please turn the air filter back on. I don't drink anything but RO, you know, so it's a thing. Um, you know, and I just, I, like, I try in the mornings, I do 10 minutes of meditation. Like this morning I woke up 10 minutes of meditation before my kids get up and I take as much help as I can get. Like, I just, I need babysitters. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. You know, and a date night and like um, retreats and yoga and like exercise. I mean, I do like 20 minutes of weights. I, I, I would love to work out more. It's just like everything, you know, we just, I don't know, we just got to make some progress where we can. And so I just try to like develop healthy routines and healthy habits. And we didn't really talk about this much, but I take thyroid medication. Um, I, it was a game changer for me. I wish I would have been on thyroid medication when I was pregnant or trying to get pregnant with my second. Um, That's when I had recurrent pregnancy loss. And I can go back retrospectively and look at my labs and see like, oh yeah, my TSH was like three and a half at one point. Like I should have been on thyroid medication, Um, but I wasn't because I didn't know all this then. Um, But I am on thyroid medication now and I was through my third pregnancy and um, it is a game changer for me. And for, you know, many of my patients, it can be like the thing that the light's went back on, you know, Um, but not everybody needs it. And like you mentioned, um, you know, patients with a low free T3, it doesn't mean they need thyroid medication, like they need to address all these other factors. So um, that plays a big role. I do, I take a lot of supplements to support my health too. And I do all this functional medicine testing on myself. Like I really like, I do it all. I'm a patient, I'm a practitioner, I do all the things. Um, I think like you said, like with all things balanced, like find the things that you know you need to do to support yourself, but don't try to push it so hard that you end up causing yourself more stress Mm -hmm. because of it. Right. Like, yeah. And this is so important with nutrition. I mean, we see some patients who are like autoimmune paleo and like, which is fine. There's like a time and place for that, but sometimes it causes more stress than the diet helps you. hundred percent. 
you know? So I'm like, we just, let's just try gluten-free and like eat real foods. Like we can yeah. simplify things. We don't yeah. have, I'm not, I've never, I've never actually done an autoimmune paleo approach. Like I haven't needed to either. I mean, I haven't had a really significant flare like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there is a time and place for an elimination diet for sure. But it's just like, it's not a long-term thing. It's a short-term sort of exploration. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I feel like we've had our thyroid 101 lesson that we probably all needed back yeah. before we ever were trying to conceive or, yeah. <laughs> you know, as, as young adults. So hopefully we caught some of our audience at that point. And for those of you that are a little bit older, like some of us, then, um, you know, we still have a lot of life to live and we want to feel vibrant. And sometimes the thyroid mm -hmm. health is a part of that. So Thank you for that. Is there a message you'd like to share about thyroid health with our audience? Some kind of glimmer of hope or something you'd like them to take away? Aside from like, I just want to say you have some fabulous uh, resources on your website. So oh, yeah. we hope everyone will go there and access those because everything from like tips to taking thyroid meds to uh, just so many. So that's a wealth. But what would you like to leave our audience with today? I think it's just if if you are on thyroid medication, you want to make sure it's the right one. Not too much, not too little. There is like this right dose and it's a precise situation. It's not great and over the counter. Like you can get over the counter thyroid, like natural desiccated glandular kind of supplements. Never seen those work. Um, they either make somebody hyperthyroid or it's not enough. And so I think the most important thing is just realize, like check your full thyroid panel, work with a doctor you trust, get on the right medication and I think that's number one, if yeah. you need it, right? Yeah. Not everybody needs it, but if you're a thyroid patient and you need it, like that can make a big difference in your life. God, that's comforting. Um, so Kristen mentioned your website and all the resources. I love your Instagram. So I have to give you a shout out for that. And for the listener, it's it's so informative, but it's very pretty. Like I love, I don't know. It's just very pleasant to look at your Instagram. I love mm -hmm. that style. What else do you have to share with, with listeners or point them to? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm on Instagram a lot. I'll yes. feed that stuff over to Facebook. Um, okay. And on my website, I mentioned I have that free ebook that you can download if you're trying to like figure out how to navigate toxins in the home. Okay. Um, and then lots of articles on there. There's an article on fertility and thyroid. There's an article on a functional medicine approach to Hashimoto's. There's the thyroid gut connection. There's one on taking thyroid medications. So okay. um, those are probably the best places, like next step resources. Okay. And is it drchristinemarin.com? It's D-R-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-M-A-R-E-N.com. Okay. And same on Instagram? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Well, well, that's it's hard to believe that went by way too fast. That's all the time we have. But thank you so much, Dr. Marion, for joining us. I, thank I you both. So much value in this. Yeah, so we appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, and thanks to all the listeners. We'll see you next time. If you'd like to access other episodes or subscribe so you don't miss a beat, you can find us at nanp.org forward slash nanp dash podcast. Membership in the NAMP provides you with a competitive advantage. Whether you're a current practitioner or a student, we want you to become an active, informed leader of the holistic nutrition community and join today at NAMP.org. NAMP is very proud to provide the highest level of professional recognition and validation in the holistic nutrition industry through the board certification and holistic nutrition credential. To earn this valuable designation, candidates must demonstrate an exceptional level of knowledge and understanding of holistic nutrition by passing a board exam and documenting client contact hours. Are you ready to boost your credibility with board certification? Visit NAMP.org today to apply. Keep in mind that the information on the NAMP podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical or legal advice. The NAMP is not liable or responsible for any harm, damage, or illness arising from the use of the information contained herein. By listening to the information on this podcast, you agree to defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the NAMP and all agents. Copyright NAMP, all rights reserved.